Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own evil. And we read next from the Gospel of Mark, another section of the Lord's teachings. And as you listen, I invite you to consider the contrast between the tone of this passage and the tone of the previous passage. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Amen. Here end the readings from the Word. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. Is life supposed to seem good? Are we missing something or misunderstanding spirituality if we don't generally enjoy our lives? Or to come at the same question the other way around, how seriously are we supposed to take life? How hard should we expect to have to work at it? How often should we expect to have to buckle down because there's something we need to do, and there is no easy way to do it. The Lord says a lot of things that could be taken as clear answers to these questions. But all of these answers that he gives us don't seem like they're saying the same thing. In the reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord said to us, there's no reason to worry. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? What is the point of worrying? What's the point of taking life so seriously that we're anxious all the time? Anxiety can't change anything about the future. It just makes the present more complicated and less pleasant. It's an obvious truth. And yet, how often do we trick ourselves into believing that we need to be anxious because bad things might happen? And if we don't hold on to anxiety, well, then nothing will be done. 
and those bad things will become inevitable. That's a pretty serious and joyless attitude towards life. And the Lord tells us so clearly that we don't need to go there. Worry doesn't help. Life doesn't need to be that intense. And perhaps more to the point, we already have what we need. The birds of the air are fed and the grass of the field is clothed. Can we not trust that the God who loves these things enough to take care of them is taking care of us as well? He even tells us, you do your part. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, everything you need, will be added to you. We may have to re-examine some of our beliefs about what we really need before we can truly hear what the Lord is saying. But the message is clear. We have what we need to be content. The Lord does not want us to be worried. He does not want us to live in an intense, anxiety-filled world. Peace I leave with you, he says. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. But he also never promises us that everything will be easy. In the passage I read from Matthew, the last thing he said was, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own evil. That statement changes the tone of the passage in an important way. The Lord tells us not to worry because worry takes away our joy. And he also tells us not to worry because worry makes things harder. And sometimes what we have to do will be hard enough as it is. Sometimes our job is to take up our cross. Sometimes the Lord says our job is to give up our life. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The cross is a symbol of temptation, a symbol of the spiritual battles that we need to fight. We associate the cross with suffering, and so people have come up with ideas about how Christian suffering is noble, but that's not what the Lord is saying here. The Lord does not want us to feel pain. Pain is not the point. The Lord simply won't hide from us the truth that there are demons we have to face, and we can't know real peace until we face them. A fundamental part of being his servant is the willingness to get up and do the right thing, to step up when it's easy and to step up when it's hard, and to do this not just once but as a pattern of life. In Luke, the Lord even says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We were not put here on earth to be comfortable. We were put here to choose what kind of people we want to be. There are demons who would work evil through us. And if we want to find heaven within us and see heaven grow around us, then we have to overcome those demons. And any amount of work required to that end is worth it because nothing less than who we are, the 
character of our soul is at stake. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So much for not worrying. So much for believing that we're okay right where we are. So much for not living in a world that's too intense. Part of what the Lord meant when he said, sufficient for the day is its own evil, is that sometimes what we have to do will be hard enough that there's no way to do it except one day at a time, one step at a time. Sometimes we're asked to give more than we think we have to give. There's even the challenging teaching that in temptation, we're made to endure not up to the limit of our strength, but beyond it. In the teachings of the new church, we're told each person's power is limited. And when temptation stretches him to the absolute limit of his power, he cannot stand up to anything further and starts to slip. At that point, however, that is when he is on the slope and starts to slip, he is raised up by the Lord. Sometimes we find ourselves on the slope, starting to fall, and we feel like our lives are out of control. And yet the Lord still said to us, don't worry. It's okay. Because it is true that hard things are required of us sometimes, we can get sucked into living in an apocalyptic world, a world that's a giant battleground. But the Lord didn't make us to live in that kind of world. In the Gospel of Luke, when he tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to to you, he also says to us, do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He has always intended that we inherit every blessing that he has prepared for us. We weren't made for battle. We were made for heaven. We were made to live in a state of peace. The seventh day of creation, which is the culmination of God's work and his vision, is a day of rest. Not a day of idleness, but of a deeper sort of rest, of peace that no evil can disturb. And the Lord wants us to believe that he will give us that peace. And he also knows that, and needs us to know, that getting to that place will not always be easy. Over and over in his word, he tries to make that balance clear. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We are tasked with holding that balance. Sometimes we have to do hard things and we can't hide from those things, and we are okay. We don't need to be anxious. We have what we need, and we are in good hands. It's hard to believe that all of those things are true at the same time, and we'll tend to focus more on one side of the picture or the other, as our state requires. Sometimes we'll really need to probe at our complacency and find those parts of our life where we're living in denial. Sometimes we need to be willing to give up being comfortable and take up the cross because 
the Lord's kingdom is worth it. Because the good people all around us are worth it. Other times, though, we'll need to remind ourselves not to take it all so seriously. Yes, there's hard work that needs to be done, but really it's the Lord who does all of the heavy lifting anyway. When we fight a spiritual battle, we fight until we can't fight anymore, and then the Lord catches us. Things are okay because he is in charge. Creation is resoundingly good because it's his creation. And it's we can stop trying so relentlessly, stop taking so much upon ourselves because it's good already, whether we try so hard or not. The birds keep on living and the flowers of the field are beautiful. The Lord loves these things, and he loves us so much more. If we trust in him, peace really is possible. The writings of the new church explain that when the Lord talks about not worrying about tomorrow, he's talking about trusting in him. Looking to tomorrow isn't a bad thing. It's not wrong to be prudent, not wrong to save up your money or look at the weather forecast. But we become anxious for tomorrow when we look at the future and try to control things that aren't ours to control. We're told people are concerned about the morrow when they're not content with their lot. Do not trust in God, but in themselves, and have solely worldly and earthly things in view, not heavenly ones. These people are ruled completely by anxiety over the future, and by the desire to possess all things and to exercise control over all other people. That desire is kindled and grows greater and greater, till at length it's beyond all measure. They grieve if they do not realize the objects of their desires, and they are distressed at the loss of them. Nor can they find consolation, for in times of loss they are angry with the divine. They reject him together with all belief and curse themselves. This is what those concerned for the morrow are like. Selfishness and restlessness and anxiety all go hand in hand. Because we, all by ourselves, don't have the power to create any of the things that we really want. We could try forever and we'd still get nowhere. And when we experience that futility, that fi inability of ourselves, by ourselves, to create happiness, we start to feel desperate and trapped. And the harder we try to make it all work without the Lord, the less we get for all our anxious work. But the passage I just read goes on. Those who trust in the divine are altogether different. Though concerned about the morrow, they are unconcerned, in that they are not anxious, let alone worried, when they give thought to the morrow. They remain even-tempered whether or not they realize desires. And they do not grieve over loss. They are content with their lot. If they become wealthy, they do not become infatuated with wealth. If they are promoted to important positions, they do not consider themselves worthier than others. If they become poor, they are not made miserable either. If lowly in status, they do not feel downcast. That for those who trust in the divine, all things are moving towards an everlasting state of happiness. And that no matter what happens to them at any time, it contributes to that state. Trusting in the Lord does not mean that everything will always be great. 
It doesn't mean that we'll always realize our desires. And it doesn't mean that we will never know loss. Trusting in the Lord means that something within us reigns that makes us okay, whatever else goes on around us. The world is sometimes a fickle place and often an anxious place. While we live in the world, we will have tribulation. While we live in the world, there will be hard things that we need to do. Trusting in the Lord gives us something stronger than the world to hold on to, something that makes us okay no matter what we have to deal with. Not as the world gives, does he give to us. Sometimes we have to focus on facing down the world's tribulations. And still, the Lord is always taking care of us. And if he is always taking care of us, then it's always possible for us to believe that today, good things can happen. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease from yielding fruit. Amen.